Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Disability Justice in Emergency Conditions, a virtual mini conference hosted by Georgetown University's Disability Studies Program with support from the uh, Department of Philosophy. My name is Joel Michael Reynolds. I'm an assistant professor of philosophy and, and disability studies at Georgetown University. I'm a white cis guy in a light blue shirt and a sweater that's very soft and a little bit too warm right now, wearing glasses, um, brown hair, brown eyes. I am very excited for us to jump into the second panel. One uh, logistical note, we're going to do questions immediately after each presentation because of uh, timing complications as opposed to taking them all at the end. Please drop questions in the chat at any point and I'll uh, read them and incorporate them as, as it makes sense to. Panel two begins with uh, doctors Donna Thompson and Eva Federkate. I'll introduce them each individually. Eva Kate is distinguished professor emeritus at Stony Brook University uh, SUNY. She has been writing about cognitive disability and philosophy since the mid 1990s and has done extensive works, extensive work in the ethics of care, among multiple other fields. Her most recent book, which if you have not read it, uh, please go buy it and read it immediately, is entitled Learning from My Daughter, The Value and Care of Disabled Minds, and it came out with Oxford University Press in 2019. Presenting alongside Eva is Donna Thompson, who is the parent of a young man with severe disabilities, uh, who is medically complex. She is the co-author with Zachary White of The Unexpected Journey of Caring. And she's the author of The Four Walls of My Freedom. Donna is a leader in family engagement in disability health research in Canada. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Drs. Kate and Thompson. Hello, I am going to share my slides. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so as everyone is uh, telling you what they look like, I have to tell you that I am uh, <clears throat> white, gray haired, what is politely called elderly, um uh, cis um uh, woman and um <clears throat> i am uh co-authoring this with uh, my friend donna who she and i have met on a number of occasions around issues that concern children such as our own um the um what I'd like to do to begin is I would like to read something from you for you that I wrote in April 2020. Uh, I called it Invisible Vulnerables because uh, at the time people were writing about uh, the vulnerabilities of various groups. Uh, one group that was very rarely mentioned uh, was um, the group that our children belong to, which are uh, people with very significant IDD with uh, multiple medical complexities. Um, I am hiding in our lovely spacious house in the woods, where I am now, with my husband, hoping that COVID-19 will not find us. Both of us are at in the at-risk category, as we are both in our 70s. We are both New Yorkers, but we are upstate because our 50 year old daughter lives in a community here. Our daughter, Sesha, has a rare genetic condition which has severely limited her cognitive and motor abilities. She lives in a house with six other people, all of whom have significant IDD and are medically fragile. An amazing and dedicated staff care for them. For the last 18 years, we have brought her to our house on weekends where we play music, listen to symphonies, watch movies, do some physical therapy exercises, take long walks, and enjoy wonderful meals that my husband manages to regale us with. 
Our son and his family sometimes join us, and our grandchildren have developed beautiful relationships with our with their atypical but sweet and very lovely, loving aunt. Next weekend, I wrote in April 2020, will be the fourth in a row when we have not visited her and she has not come home with us. Well, after about seven or eight weeks, I stopped counting. Uh, the, um, sorry, 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 I, I just, something happened here. Um, <clears throat> how do I advance this? How do I advance my, oh, there it is. Okay. So here we have uh, Sasha at uh, home. Um, and um, you'll also see pictures of Sasha at her 50th birthday party um, at home with her brother and her, uh, all her male kin. For people with disabilities and people whose disabilities ordinarily require a very high level of care, people like my beautiful daughter, uh, there's no possibility of social distancing. Most of us would perish in a matter of days if left alone. For many, touch is the most powerful form of communication. I might be able to explain to her why we cannot visit why we can send only virtual kisses, not the close, mushy ones she loves best. But I would not know if she understood. In likelihood, uh, well, likelihood she would understand bits of it, but it would give her no coherent sense of what is happening in the world and why suddenly what is occurring globally means that she cannot come back to mom and dad on weekends and why we are prevented from even visiting her in her house. And there we are several months into COVID. Finally, we were allowed to visit her. Here are the three of us. Uh, we we're masked, supervised. Later on, we had to wear goggles as well. Uh, we could visit for only one hour. We had to be set to be scheduled in advance and we could only see her like once a week. Uh, in non-COVID times, we could visit anytime, night or day without advance notice, and we did. Donna, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Eva. So um, I am a white woman also with white hair <laughs> and I'm getting into that category of older woman now too, dare I say elderly. Um, and this is uh, an image of my family um, and Pardon the mask, I'm wearing a mask, um, a COVID mask, because I'm actually at the hospital with my son, um, who is in uh, observation in the emergency room. And I've just taken a short break from him. He is with his permanent nurse, uh, so he's not alone. But um, this is a, a relevant uh, thing to mention today, I think, in light of what we're going to be talking about in the uh, conception of parents as essential family caregivers in the circle of care. So this is my family. Um, before COVID, you can see that we're a big, happy family and that Nicholas is often really the center um, of our family. Next slide, Eva. And when COVID hit, um, we were also, like Eva, locked out. We were not allowed to visit Nicholas. Um, eventually, we were allowed to have what they called window visits. And this is a window visit with me standing outside three panes of glass and Nicholas inside. Um, we couldn't see each other because of the reflection. Nicholas has low vision anyway. He is non-speaking, um, but he has bags of capacity in other respects, as you see the, his lively face and his great sense of humor. I couldn't read his body language, which is a key tool in communication. And so I was quite upset actually, when I took this picture, there were tears on my cheeks um, and we did not try this window visit again. It was uh, a, an abject failure in terms of um, trying to feel close. We felt further apart than ever before in this window visit. 
Next slide. But we did get to see him at Christmas. And when rules relaxed, of course, we were given um, full support, uh, the same as staff, full PPE. We're wearing goggles and masks in this image. And we were able, Nicholas was not allowed to come home for Christmas, but um, we, we were able to visit him, which was a great blessing for our family. The next slide. So, Eva, do you want to take this one? I think you're muted, Eva. Uh, so we, uh, as we talked, we realized that what we were seeing here was um, a converging framework of an ethic of care and the rights of the disabled um, by which we could situate uh, the work that Donna and uh, the wonderful family she's working with in uh, Canada have been doing. And uh, the I went back to uh, Carol Gilligan because I recalled that there was some line in there about how the worst hurt in the case of uh, the worst harm in the case of an ethics of care was the severing of relations. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, in the US has kept that, that has been characteristic of that painful isolation and still keeps us in the US from helping in the care of our very vulnerable loved ones. And also um, a case that was brought out in Canada uh, that argued from the human rights of the disabled. At the beginning of the fear, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, fear gripped us all. This is a disease of contagion, and the way to prevent contagion is exactly the severing of connections, is to prevent contact. But our children cannot go on one day without contact. They cannot feed, toilet, clothe themselves. No contact for them is the equivalent of death. Those charged with the care of people with IDD and medical complexity oh, saw the only avenue to protect them was one in which family or close others were kept away. Only a restricted number of contacts could be permitted. The homes of each of our children um, did what uh, they could to keep our children from dying. Both, thank goodness, so far at least, have been very successful. And people with these disabilities are six times as likely to get COVID and four times as likely to die. But the cost has been quite tremendous. Uh, to our disabled children who are left without the resources and comfort and essential person in their midst, uh, in, and, in, and especially in the midst of this fear and weirdness of the time of seeing your caregivers come in with masks and goggles and and, and you can't speak to them, you can't ask them, what is this, you know, what is going on? Uh, to the caregiving staff that had to deal with absences due to their, their or their family's encounter with the virus and the quarantines that followed any exposure. Their efficacy is in very severely, has been very severely impacted uh, when they're short in staffing, which they frequently were because people were out uh, either for illness or because of quarantine. They mostly live in families where the rest of the family members are essential workers. They do not have the privilege to stay home from work. Um, and uh, many also uh, worked other jobs. And it was a great cost to us, the parents or long-term caregivers. You don't mean to say it's only parents, it can also be uh, long-time caregivers who are not familiar 
whose moral identities, but our moral identities are bound up with the relationships of our moral, uh, with our vulnerable loved ones. Going back to Carol Gilligan, I did find this very important point. The threat of disruption of an affiliation is perceived not just as a loss of relationship, but as loss as something closer to a total loss of self. And no more so uh, than when we see the distress in that disruption, that disruption causes in the person with whom we have such an affiliation. Many of you will, re remember, will remember Carol Gilligan's Heinz Dilemma, where Heinz has a wife who is uh, dying of uh, cancer, and the pharmacist has a drug which is far too expensive, and the uh, Jake and Amy, two children in studies, are asked um, whether Heinz should steal the drug. And uh, Jake um, sees this as a conflict of life and property that can be resolved by a logical deduction. Amy as a fracture of human relationship that must be mended with its own thread. And in thinking about COVID, it's so easy to see that in the COVID dilemma, there are two very different moral problems, a, a conflict that is between contagion and care that can be resolved only by strict isolation protocols, and the other, a fracture of human relations that must be mended with its own thread. Donna? So the way that this, um, this moral dilemma and this distress played out in families of children with disabilities, and indeed, families of residents in long-term care and even in acute care hospitals was that uh, essential family caregivers or the closest people in intimate relations with someone who had care needs uh, was reconceived from visitor to essential partner in care. So a visitor would be defined as a guest of the patient and does not participate in their care. Whereas the essential care partner is designated uh, by the patient and supports and participates in care, all kinds of care, including uh, decision-making, substitute decision-making or supported decision-making. And now we know that there's quite a lot of evidence, body of evidence that shows that essential family care partners presence um, with people who are receiving care improves patient safety and reduces harm. And it improves um, the, the life experience, of course, of the person receiving care, but also uh, the experience of staff. And so what happened was that um, there was a mother, this is my friend Pamela Libralesso and her son Joey. And Pamela and her husband were prevented from seeing their 14 year old son Joey for almost a year. Uh, and this was intolerable for all concerned. Joey uh, uses touch as you can see to communicate, was unable to social distance, uh, was not allowed to come home. His parents were not allowed on the premises uh, where Joey lived. And so Pamela went to um, a legal, a pro bono legal um, sort of entity. And this, the lawyers uh, brought the case to the Ontario Human Rights Commission and argued that the strict isolation policies of COVID breached Joey's right to have his parents in his life. It was a breach of relationship. And in the judgment, the judge said that human rights protections do not go away in a pandemic. As a result of the province losing this court case in the provincial human rights uh, tribunal, the, the, the rules were changed. And 
we have in policy, embedded in policy now, the fact that parents will never again ever be shut out of the circle of care uh, in developmental services because we are essential in the circle of care. Next slide. And uh, I mentioned that there is a, a large body of evidence in case anyone wanted to take a screenshot of this. These are um, all uh, papers that have been written showing evidence of reduced harm to patients and families um, with essential family presence and also reduced um, uh, medical error and also reduced mortality in the case of, particularly in the case of long-term care and acute care, because families went in and fed and bathed and you know, delivered direct care in staff shortages during COVID. So um, we, we very much welcome your questions. Thank you. We might also say uh, that, um, of course, much of what we have to, um, much of what the essential caregiver uh, program illuminates are issues that have to do with uh, people with various kinds of disabilities, uh, but also with uh, people in various uh, situations of um, distress um, caused by diseases, of various kinds, um, where the presence of an advocate at the bedside is essential, essential for their well-being, essential for the staff being able to do the work that they do. Uh, Sarah Miller spoke very eloquently earlier about the moral harm of uh, for uh, care providers when they're the ones holding the hands of uh, the person who is dying of COVID. Um, so I think what uh, the, the program that uh, Donna is uh, illuminating here and informing us about is one that needs to be put in place for all future crises. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are essential caregivers, be, be essential and can be just one. It can be a person who can be well protected, well trained, just like any other staff member can be. Um, and uh, that person needs to be included in the circle of care in the rest of this pandemic and in all future cases. Now, questions? Absolutely. And, and finally, I guess uh, that I wanted to make another point that I forgot to mention earlier as well, that, that this whole situation for, for families in Canada um, in, in, across the country um, ignited a, a, a movement. You know, we had never come together as parents of children living in congregate care. We have never organized ourselves before this happened. And when we were locked out, all of a sudden, we have a movement now um, with political clout. Um, and we are talking about many things. So we, in, in my province of Canada, we won this particular uh, policy agenda item of having us embedded as essential family caregivers. And the next policy uh, advocacy um, campaign is around mandated vaccines for staff in congregate care settings. And so that's the next thing we're going to tackle. But we are organized now. So it's been, that's been the silver lining for us. Thank you both so much for that fantastic joint presentation. As I mentioned at the top, uh, we're going to break with the previous schedule and do the Q&A for this uh, presentation immediately, like now. <laughs> um, we have approximately seven to eight minutes for that. You can raise your virtual hand or your real hand, or you can drop your question in the chat. Okay. 
questions. <laughs> well, I'll ask a question then. Uh, I'm extremely encouraged to hear the, the successes in a Canadian context. Uh, do either of you want to speak a bit about what would be necessary <laughs> to pull off such successes in our um, uh, idiosyncratically problematic uh, United States context, uh, where it might be a little harder to do so, at least I think in general? Donna, you had some good suggestions. I, Donna and I have talked about this because um, where my daughter lives uh, is really quite a wonderful place and she has a wonderful life there. Um, they have been incredibly good in protecting both the residents and the staff. And their very success um, has um, made it very difficult for me uh, to approach them um, with a different model. Um, and uh, so uh, that's that's on the individual level of, of one particular place. Not all places have had this kind of success. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, that may open up more room for uh, discussion. But I think it's a very difficult thing to tell people who have been working as hard as they have to be taking care of your children, to then tell them <laughs> it's not good enough. And, um, and that's, that's my particular quandary. And I know Donna has some things to say about that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I get so upset when I hear stories of fear, uh, of a, approaching this subject with, and I hear these stories from everywhere all the time, that people are very afraid to speak to administrators of congregate care homes when the care is so good and they've been able to manage containment of the virus and so forth. There may be many reasons we are afraid to bring up these subjects with, um, or you know, any kind of enhanced care that we may feel strongly about, we're afraid. And we are in a position of a poverty as opposed to the sort of perceived abundance of the home and all of what it represents to our families. We just, and you know, the thing is about this issue is that like we were saying last night when we were talking about this, say, Eva, that isolation in and of itself, if, if we really believe that isolation was key to our children um, surviving COVID, we would leave them alone from their staff, but then they would die because they cannot bathe themselves or feed themselves or, or, or manage to maintain their own lives without help. What we have, what we've managed to do in Canada is we've managed to position uh, one or two people who are closest to a person with disabilities in their life with the same moral, equal, professional status, personal status that is essential to the life and limb of, of, the, of a resident with disabilities as staff. So they, we simply have widened the circle of containment. And there's nothing wrong with that. It cannot be argued, I don't think, if you believe that relationships matter. So I, you know, I, we, we are, but, but we are powerless in many ways because we are so grateful to people who look after our children. And it makes me upset. Thank you for that response. Uh, uh, we have a question from Dr. Sermondo. I'm assuming by putting it in chat, do you, do you wanna just say this, Joe? 
Yeah, I can. I, yeah. I um I figured I'd I'd put it in chat and if somebody else had some other thing to raise, I would sort of defer to them. But um if uh if you think it's something I should raise and I can. Um so I actually am working on uh, a similar issue around um sort of what I'm not referring to as congregate, but as institutional care. Um, and uh, the reason why I'm, I'm using uh, institutional rather than congregate care is because I'm, I'm trying to make um, a distinction that plays off of um, the role of, of power differential between the, the folks on the receiving end and the folks on the giving end of care. And I'm, I'm arguing that an institution can be anywhere, right? An institution, there can be an institution of one, um, depending on um, the amount of control the person receiving care has over that care, right? Or their proxies. Um, and so um, I'm wondering if, if, if this framing um, would, be, would be useful um, to what um, you guys are, are talking about here. I, I think I see the value of thinking about it through the ethics of care for sure. Um, but I also am, am thinking about it in terms of relational personal autonomy um, and just sort of the idea that this at the end of the day is a, is a sort of a problem within sort of the structure, um, especially in the United States, but the structure of caregiving and the sort of inherent power imbalance between those providing and giving care. Um, and I think, you know, um, what, what you said, Ava, really drove that home that even in places that are giving really good high quality care that power imbalance still e exists right mm -hmm. and so if you don't have control over who is providing that care how it's being provided and so on and so forth these kinds of problems can pop up um even when the caregiving is is good um and so i just wanted to ask about that about whether or not um or, or why um you would look at it sort of through the ethics of care rather than through um, personal relational autonomy? I think we need to look through it through many lenses um, because they, they, they all give us another aspect of the, the, the dimension of the, the difficulties. And I, I really thank you, Joe. I'm very excited about what you said you were doing uh, because, and, and I had actually talked to uh, Donna about this. I, I'm a little hesitant to say it in public, but um, I will. Um, and that is that when uh, Sasha lived at home with us for 32 years, uh, we never thought she would live anywhere else. Uh, but at a certain point, we realized that she needed to have her own community. She needed to have people uh, that, uh, that that weren't mom, dad, and a caregiver. Uh, and um, and at that point, she she went to uh, this wonderful place. Um, and uh, one of the things that I thought was so important was that I knew I had access to her at any time, uh, day or night, <laughs> coming in at two o'clock in the morning, which I had done without any warning. <laughs> you know, this was... Sesha's home, and I could go to Sesha's home. And for the first time in that, uh, in this 19 years now, 20 years now, I felt that little bit of that, should I say stink, <laughs> that, that, that odor <laughs> of institutionalization. And uh, you know, again, again, it's it's so difficult because, as Donna said, you know, we are so grateful to the people who take care of our children and who take good care of our children. Um, and they pride themselves on not being an institution in the sense, you know, in that kind of. But I think bringing up this question of power imbalance and how care should be delivered is uh, really, really useful. And I think you are absolutely right. You can have an institution of two. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's how that uh, power dynamic is worked. It is how um, the care is given. It's the kind of respect one has, each party has for the other party uh, that is uh, important 
in trying to make possible congregate care that is both safe, humane, and really valuable to the person who is living there. That's, uh, I hate to cut discussion off, but to stay on schedule, we do want to move to the next uh, speaker. I will just throw in for those watching on YouTube later, a uh, comment in the chat. Um, uh, Dr. April Dorit said, great point, Joe. Healthcare and bioethics is now all about autonomy. Surrogates of people with IDD and with medical complexities have to grab their autonomous rights. <laughs> All right, thank you both so much. I'm delighted to um, introduce our next speaker, which is Mercer Gary. First, I will get you up on the screen here. Uh, Mercer Gary's talk is entitled Telemedicine and the redistribution of care, lessons in access and intimacy from COVID-19. Gary is a Crawford Fellow in Ethical Inquiry at the Rock Ethics Institute and a PhD candidate in philosophy and in women's gender and sexuality studies at Penn State. Her work takes up contemporary issues in the care sector as a way of addressing conceptual issues in feminist ethics. You can find samples of her writing in the in IJFAB, the International Journal for Feminist Approaches to Bioethics, as well as the Hastings Center Report. Take it away. Sorry to saddle you with that acronym, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'll get my slides started and get going. So I want to extend my thanks to everyone in the audience, uh, my fellow panelists and other speakers. This has been a great mini conference so far. And especially, uh, I want to express my thanks to Joel and everyone at Georgetown who's helped this come together in a relatively short order uh, and uh, in such a beautiful way. So I'm speaking today from the ancestral lands of the Leni Lenape and Susquehannock peoples. While land acknowledgments are not the same as land back, I want to recognize that the existence of my current institution, Penn State, uh, is dependent on the dispossession of over 100 indigenous tribes through the 1862 Morrill Act. The university and all those who participated in it carry responsibilities to redress this ongoing violence. I'll give a brief description of myself. I am a white cis woman with red hair and uh, glasses worn inadvisably on her head, uh, uh, sitting uh, wearing a gray blazer uh, in front of uh, a white wall with shelves in the background. Uh, so my talk today is part of a work in progress analyzing the impact of increasing telemedicine use on the relationships that many disability theorists and feminist philosophers of disability have cited as the basis of our shared ethical life. Uh, I hope that it will build on and connect some of the conversations that were started in the last presentation as well. Telemedicine purports to extend access to healthcare, but as I will show, this set of technological interventions is neither accessible nor politically representative of a feminist notion of care. The argument here has implications both for the use of telemedicine specifically and the more general relationship between distance and care. Without negating the useful contributions of these technologies, I argue that telemedicine tends to obscure the hands-on work of more precarious carers on whom remote doctoring depends. Non-physician healthcare workers, family and community caregivers, and telemedicine users themselves end up bearing the brunt of the caring load. These carers and their efforts, rather than the enhancement of the virtual encounter, need to be care ethics site of theoretical and material investment, as well as the site of investment of, the, of society as a whole. 
I'll begin with an overview of telemedical interventions before interrogating just how conducive they are to increased healthcare access. I'll then frame telemedicine as an issue of disability justice and question its legitimacy as a form of feminist care, given the ways this techno technology delegates the in-person, hands-on work underlying all other attempts at care. I'll explore the possibility of telemedicine increasing self-determination while giving some caveats as to how that might best occur. So I follow Bashir in defining telemedicine as the use of technologies that facilitate patient provider communication. Telemedicine should therefore not be equated with the wider category of telehealth, which includes health promotion technologies that operate independently of a medical professional. In its most basic sense, telemedicine is a fairly long-standing practice involving relatively simple technology appearing in the second half of the 20th century as remote medical consults via telephone. Such forms of communication may be synchronous, like a live call, or asynchronous, uh, like secure messaging, and may make use of either solely audio or audiovisual connection. Developments in virtual reality technologies for telehealth are neither sufficiently advanced nor widely distributed enough to it impact my discussion here. Within the context of COVID-19, telemedicine has been touted as an efficient way of limiting in-person visits to preserve resources and protect vulnerable persons from exposure to the virus. The introduction of digital questionnaires establishing the reason for a patient's visit, for example, allows clinicians to sort out which patients might be better served by a virtual appointment whether due to the nature of their concern, their increased risk of contracting the virus, or the impossibility of travel. My focus, however, will be on telepresence or the simulation of a visit by means of an audio or video call. Such virtual visits may take place in a variety of settings, including satellite clinics and patients' homes, as we'll see in a moment. So telemedicine is positioned as a tool of increasing access to healthcare due to its purported ability to transcend existing lim limitations of the contemporary American system. I say transcend here intentionally as telemedical interventions do not directly address the factors barring access to care, but rather seek to bridge some existing gaps. And the barriers to accessing medical care are many, individual, economic and sociopolitical factors all underlie the struggle to obtain quality medical attention in a brick and mortar clinic. An individual's compromised immune system, for, for instance, puts them at greater risk of iatrogenic infection, especially during a pandemic. The anticipation of racialized, ableist, or transphobic discrimination awaiting in the clinic further alienates many marginalized persons from the medical establishment making the minimal interaction afforded by telemedicine more attractive. In rural areas especially, telemedicine, uh, uh, physician shortages and hospital closures make accessing in-person healthcare challenging in the best of times. Add to that the travel restrictions, resource shortages, and uh, increased clinical risk of a pandemic and we get conditions ripe for telemedicine's explosion. In principle, at least, telemedicine could help patients overcome each of these barriers by virtually connecting uh, would-be uh, healthcare users with doctors and systems that remain out of reach. However, Telemedicine's efforts to transcend both patient level and systemic barriers to access are often stymied. For instance, the success of most telemedical interventions relies on a strong and dependable internet connection. But 20%, 21% of those living in rural America stated that they experienced problems accessing high-speed internet, with 10% experiencing major problems. Disparities in internet access along racialized and class lines are present in urban areas as well, 
where a 2017 Census Bureau's American Community Survey showed that about 15 million urban or metro households lack broadband service. Even where internet access is present, moreover, many telemedicine interfaces do not admit of multiple modes of interaction or are incompatible with assistive devices, thereby keeping the technology inaccessible to many disabled people. A general lack of user friendliness in design also inhibits the technology's accessibility, particularly for aging users who make up a major target population for telemedicine in the first place. With both the motives behind the adoption of this technology and its practical shortcomings in mind, my framing of telemedicine as an issue of disability justice becomes clearer. Telemedicine's target population sits squarely at the intersections of chronic illness, rurality, race, class, and aging, demanding a multidimensional understanding of disability as intertwined with other axes of oppression. Following SIN's Invalid Director Patty Byrne, I understand disability justice as necessarily intersectional, requiring the interrogation of the intentional production of impairment as a tool of domination and the transformation of mutually and requiring the transformation of mutually informing logics of ableism, racism, and colonialism. While intended to increase access in areas underserved by the contemporary healthcare system, telemedicine's understanding of access remains in a largely formal register, neglecting both the practical conditions of possibility for participation in this technology, as well as the structural underpinnings that have made the technology necessary in the first place. But even if telemedicine is able to overcome the remaining barriers and genuinely increase access to medical attention, the technology's con contribution to ethically significant care requires assessment in its own right. For the sake of this argument, I follow Daniel Engster's definition of the activity of care as, quote, helping individuals to develop and sustain their basic or innate capabilities, including the abilities for sensation, movement, emotion, imagination, reason, speech, affiliation, and in most societies today, the ability to read, write, and perform basic math. Much, anal end quote. Much analysis has focused on what we might call the relational adequacy of the physician-patient relationship within telemedicine. This line of critique asks whether the technological mediation makes possible the kind of insight, motivation, and practical practical need provision necessary for the genuine development and sustenance of these capabilities. There are significant obstacles to the, rem the remote physician being able to provide such relationally adequate care without sharing physical space with the patient, obstacles that seem insurmountable in at least some fields of medicine. But this will not be my focus today. I argue that a more immediate problem has received less attention and will continue to be no neglected so long as we prioritize the enhancement of the virtual encounter. Our focus instead should lie with the more precarious caregivers whose physical ministrations make possible the work of the re remote physician. This focus is necessary within an, an understanding of care as a specifically feminist project rather than an endorsement of any mode of need meeting. My argument is that even if telemedicine can meet the demand for relational adequacy, it risks failing the political standard of care committed to prioritizing the nece necessary and most marginalized labor. So rather than focus on the diminishment of care given by the physician, I turn my attention to the heightened burden and responsibilities placed on proximate others. Uh, the success of telemedicine depends on this physical labor that's often too, le too often left out of the picture. The others who are performing this labor include non-physician health care workers, family and community partners in care, and telemedicine users themselves. The delegation can occur in multiple ways. 
Uh, here we have a, a diagram of the hub and spoke model, for instance, which relies on outpost clinics with full staff who help virtually connect users with physicians located elsewhere. Not only does the outpost clinical staff perform clerical and administrative labor necessary to keep the operation running, they also perform physical tasks on the bodies of the telemedicine users. At least some of this physical labor is best understood as care work. A certified nurse's assistant slides an inflatable cuff up a patient's arm to measure her blood pressure. A physician's assistant holds another's foot in his hand to palpate painful joints. There is potential at least for relational as well as medical value in these interactions. Both the laying on the hands and the mere physically attuned active listening can demonstrate concern and attention in a way that helps alleviate some stress of the encounter. Far from mere clinical mediators then, these actors are contributing meaningfully through their embodied presence. The physical proximity of support healthcare workers towards their patients engender specific responsibilities that cannot be fulfilled by the distant physician. The delivery of bad news, like a poor prognosis, demonstrates this point clearly. When possible, some facilities offering telemedicine will decline to deliver such news virtually at all. But if bad news is given via video call, the support worker present with the patient turns into the proximate other to whom the patient can respond in grief or anguish. These physical and effective exchanges integral to the delivery of care are neither eliminated nor fulfilled by the virtual physician, but instead must be performed by another likely more precarious worker. Uses of telemedicine that instead bring the clinic home often involve family members or other community caregivers in the medical visit itself. While serving in similar capacities as the non-physician healthcare workers in the clinic, their participation in the healthcare delivery process is even less recognized. Unlike the presence of a, of a support healthcare worker in the clinic, the at-home care partner is more likely to have a pre-existing relationship with the patient and can thus relate to the patient with a greater degree of intimacy. Rather than treating the at-home care partner as a fellow professional separate from the patient, the remote physician approaches the patient and the care partner as a fellow, as a dyad that itself functions individually in developing a trust relationship with the telehealth team. Whether supporting, uh, supporting uh, telemedicine users emotionally, emotionally or assisting in physical maneuvers, the at-home partner or in-community partner becomes the user's locus of care. Finally, virtually all telemedical practices displace at least some labor onto the users themselves. While most contemporary healthcare uh, consumers engage in some self-monitoring of their symptoms before a clinical visit, telemedicine patients do to a greater degree by involving the use of medical instruments to measure vital statistics and tracking the results of medical interventions over a longer period of time. Describing an Italian telemedical call center connecting patients in their homes with remote cardiologists, Davide Nicolini, sociologist, uh, concludes that, quote, the introduction of telemedicine achieves a similar result to that obtained with the introduction of self-service in catering and purchasing. It transfers aspects of the task and the knowledge necessary to perform it to the client. Although the physician's guidance is helpful and possibly reassuring, the daily or on hourly management of a chronic condition is left to the chronically ill person themselves. So none of these relationships to non-physician care partners are inherently problematic, nor necessarily representative of a neoliberal move to self-responsibilization. Some from a disability justice perspective might in fact be, de be desirable. We might, for instance, understand telemedicine as an avenue for increasing self-determination among healthcare users. Extracting necessary medical attention from the clinical environment itself may be attractive, not only as the processes of getting to the doctor's office are themselves difficult, 
but also the medical encounter may be more traumatizing than healing. Further self-reported benefits from telemedicine users include an increased sense of confidence and knowledge of their own needs, as well as a greater sense of participation and independence in the clinical partnership that allows them to build on the significant experiential knowledge of having a, a particular diagnosis. The possibility of telemedicine to support the goals of disability justice, however, is routinely undermined. Telemedicine users are often expected to graduate from their use of self-monitoring equipment before users feel they are themselves ready and willing to do so. The setup of the telemedical relationship, moreover, remains within a paternalistic frame dictated both by the structure of the technology and the overseeing medical professional. Support staff, community caregivers, and telemedicine users themselves have also reported greater need for support. The larger, the larger point reflected by these calls for aid is that any sense of autonomy must be understood relationally. For telemedicine to enhance genuine self-determination, we would require supporting relationships that make such self-determination possible, including supporting relationships to oneself that enable a greater and more comprehensive care. So my point is not that redistributing the direct work of care from the hands of physicians to others is itself a problem. Indeed, these have always been and will always be key loci of care. When properly supported, uh, this can be greatly preferred over clinical relationships, particularly as a way of prioritizing the deep knowledge that telemed telemedicine users have of their own needs. Telemedicine's way of delegating care to others does become a problem where it makes that delegation both invisible and fails to provide resources to those doing the material work of caring for bodies. In addition to the burden on individual precarious care workers, both paid and unpaid, Neglecting telemedicine's delegation of labor has serious consequences for the society as a whole. Recently renewed conversations in both crisis management and political economy point to the care sector as the ground on which our social world is built. Without direct care for our physical, psychological, and social needs, no other human projects are possible. When we undermine our collective ability to provide for basic needs, as we do when we focus on technological development at the, at the expense of hands-on care by chronically ill people and their supporters, we become like the tiger that eats its own tail. This isn't to say that we should give up on telemedicine, but it's pr and, and to acknowledge that its presence in our lives will certainly outlast the pandemic. But the expansion of telemedicine must foreground financial and social support for those providing the direct hands-on care that remains essential even in our increasingly virtual context. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for that talk, Mercer. We're running a little bit behind, but I think if we take our break around 2.45, uh, everything should be just fine. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker and then following that talk we'll take questions both for Marissa Gary and Katie Sabin. Uh, our next speaker is Katie Sabin. The title of her talk is It Wrecked My Support System, Holes in the Social Safety Net for Disabled Adults During COVID-19. Katie, let me get you on screen here. Katie Savin is a disabled activist and an assistant clinical professor in the social work program at the University of the Pacific School of Health Sciences. She recently graduated from UC Berkeley, where she wrote a dissertation on the impact of Social Security Administration policy on the individual and communal disability experience. Her research also explores health inequities and public health bioethics. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Savin. The floor the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, 
Joel for organizing. Thank you, ASL interpreters and captioners for your access. Um, and I'm honored to be here with such esteemed co-panelists and speakers. Um, I'll share my screen for slides. Okay. So um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the 13 million adults in the US under the age of 65 who received supplemental security income, which I'll refer to here on as SSI and or social security disability insurance or SSDI benefits um, as their primary source of income had to navigate a complex web of social welfare policies interlocking benefit programs and social stigma. These benefits, these benefit amounts leave over 40% of people living in poverty, according to the US Federal Poverty Line. I apologize, I have a couple slides out of order. Okay. Um, so the benefits leave over 40% of these people living in poverty according to the US Federal Poverty Line, which many argue is far too low at about 12,800 per year. On this slide, there's a bar chart entitled Comparison of SSI and SSDI Benefits to Federal Poverty Line. There are three columns on the left. The, the left column indicates the average SSI amount at about $780. The middle bar shows the average SSDI monthly amount at about 1250 And then the third bar shows the federal poverty line adjusted from the annual amount to the monthly at just over $1,000. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, the expansion of some social benefit programs, despite the expansion of some social benefit programs, Disabled adults living on SSI and SSDI have faced worsening poverty and material deprivation, disruptions to care routines, and additional struggles managing welfare benefits, among others. While these harms do not often rise to the level of headlines, they carry serious implications for people's ability to make ends meet and maintain a sense of self-worth. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, so during this presentation, I'll share some pandemic experiences of disabled adults from California who receive SSI and or SSDI uh, to exemplify these harms. To do so, I'll draw from my dissertation entitled Playing the Game on SSI and SSDI Benefits, How Social Security Policy shapes the individual, societal, and communal disability experience, which is a qualitative study that explores how disabled people in California's Bay Area make ends meet on SSI and SSDI benefits, and investigates how these experiences impact beneficiaries' sense of self and identity. I interviewed 33 working age adults in an in-depth, semi-structured format, followed by four member check groups to receive feedback on my data analysis. A constructivist grounded theory approach to data, anal to data analysis was used um, to analyze the qualitative data. And throughout a critical disability studies theoretical foundation guided me. While I did not set out to explore the impact of emergency conditions, the COVID-19 pandemic began when I had about two thirds of my interviews still remaining. As a high-risk disabled researcher interviewing other disabled adults, I quickly pivoted to phone and video conferences for my interviews. I did not change the focus of my interviews. However, I knew the impact of COVID-19 would become inextricable from my questions on quotidian survival and sense of self. And so I added a question to my interview guide to explicitly ask about participants' COVID-related experiences. 
I have taken the opportunity granted to me by this conference to analyze and present findings from the data previously coded with the code COVID, which referred to life situations that changed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before describing some of these findings, I will back up a bit and explain a bit more to you about the context of my dissertation that will also frame this analysis. The experience of living on SSI and SSDI benefits goes beyond a very low income. Beneficiaries must follow complex and outdated rules, such as SSI's limit of $2,000 in assets in order to maintain benefits, which has not been updated for the entirety of my own lifetime since the 1980s. To enforce this policy, SSI routinely surveils its, uh, its beneficiaries' bank accounts with threats to take away benefits from those who violate the policy. Hence, the Social Security Administration is an institution with significant power to shape the disability experience. This power ranges from determining who is deemed disabled, setting income levels, providing income and making rules disabled beneficiaries must follow in order to maintain their cash benefits, to encoding a widely accepted definition of disability as a status in contradistinction to participation in the labor market. By defining disability as a medical inability to work, the SSA creates a binary of labor market participation that precludes disabled beneficiaries from participating in it. Outside of the formal labor market, disabled beneficiaries must develop their own informal strategies to make ends meet. These strategies are often creative, interdependent, and effective. However, they also tend to be associated with underground markets and constant struggles for survival. One major finding from my dissertation I refer to as the social security model of disability. This model considers the impacts of SSA policy to shape the disability experience and is informed by Deborah Stone's political model of disability. The social model of disability refers to the iterative process experienced by participants in which SSA policy shapes society's perception of disability identity as non-participation in the workforce. Participa participants felt devalued by society at large due to their disabilities, and participants limited their own development of families and careers in order to abide by SSA policy and maintain their benefits. This graphic depicts the social security model of disability showing an iterative process. On the upper left side, the text reads SSA defines disability as the inability to work, which sits above an arrow pointing to, towards three arrows in a circle, indicating a repeating cycle with this corresponding text. The first arrow, SSA policy shapes society's perception of disability as identity, of disability identity as non-participation in the workforce. The next, Disabled people experience stigma of shirkers or malingerers by society at large. And the third, in order to maintain benefits, disabled people limit their own development of families and careers. I applied this model to shape my analysis of findings related to COVID-19 in order to consider the overarching impact of SSA policy and how it ripples out into participants' economic capacity and decision-making, use of social safety net programs, engagement in the labor market, and sense of identity. This is the first time I'm presenting this model, and I welcome any feedback or questions that may arise. So moving into findings, um, they covered uh, an analysis of all excerpts from my data coded as COVID-19 and show that the pandemic disrupted multiple areas of life, including financial management and buying power, 
formal and informal support systems, welfare program eligibility and management, and access to employment. I'll describe each of these areas in more depth along with examples from the data. Worsening poverty. Poverty plagued participants pre-pandemic, yet became even worse as a result of it. While people's SSI and SSDI benefit levels remain unchanged, inflation has meant that the cost of basic goods, such as groceries, continues to rise. Living in an expensive area, such as California's Bay Area, on federally set incomes as low as $700 per month requires very careful budgeting. Further, an asset limit of $2,000 per month does $2,000 per person does not leave room for personal safety nets. Even small increases in the cost of necessities caused major disruptions to participants. As one participant stated, well, COVID has made things, it's made things be higher money-wise to pay for things. Food, I'm noticing my PGE has gone up, my rent went up, cable prices have gone up, and you know, it's just making it harder for people to survive. Like right now, during the pandemic, probably about three times a week, I'm missing meals. Further, participants experienced added necessities not previously accounted for in their budgets, such as masks and copious amounts of hand sanitizer or other cleaning supplies. These seemingly minor items also wreaked havoc on tight budgets. What kills me is when the account is overdrawn and you've got to pay the overdraft fees. And when they take it out of your account at the beginning, the beginning of the month when your check comes in, you know, bye-bye. And I've had that happen the last couple of months because of COVID and everything. When participants had to take funds out of their monthly benefit at the start of the month, their whole monthly benefit was thrown off and they went into cycles such as this that were difficult to climb out of. This participant was eventually able to borrow money from a friend, an option not available to everyone. Okay. The next topic, personal care neglect. Many participants also used the service that also used the California Home and Community Based Service Benefit, known as In Home Support Services or IHSS. As discussed in the previous talks, many people faced disruptions to their normal care routines during the pandemic as personal touch took on new risks. One participant described a particularly challenging situation in which she lost most of her personal care at the start of the pandemic. Most of my IHSS workers also work part-time at a local long-term care facility where there was a COVID outbreak. So they couldn't come at all once and it wrecked my support system. It's so hard to hire people at the wages IHSS provides. So I experienced a lot of neglect. This participant lost their in-home support workers early in the pandemic for over two months. Three of the people who worked for them also worked in a nearby long-term care facility, which had a COVID outbreak early on in the pandemic, which meant they were exposed and or diagnosed with COVID and could not work for them for some time. In this person's county, IHSS wages were about $15 per hour, which is very low, particularly considering that local cost of living and the risks taken on by in-person work. While they and other participants tried to increase the wages by asking workers to work fewer hours than they reported, they still found that wages were too low to hire new workers quickly enough, meaning they spent several weeks with little support. This participant is a wheelchair user whose apartment had a single step leading into it that their home care attendants typically helped them manage. When they lost most of their attendance, they found that they were also stuck inside their home. The pandemic did prompt some rethinking of the US welfare state as more people came to depend on it and thus reimagine the amount of money that might be necessary to distribute for newly unemployed people to survive. While this had short-term and hopefully long-term positive outcomes for welfare beneficiaries, 
It disrupted the rigid social security rules that many participants live by. Many participants also use the housing benefit, Section 8, to access affordable housing in the pricey Bay Area on their SSI or SSDI incomes. Through Section 8, people pay just 30% of their reported income towards their rent. Reporting income to Section 8 was a complex process of accounting for all one's income and assets that is repeated on an annual basis. One participant described a nightmarish situation she faced during her annual reporting. They tripled my rent recently because I got the stimulus from the government. So they tripled my rent and ugh. So now I'm paying my rent as it was before they tripled it. And I contacted the housing authority and told them, please lower my rent. I think you made a mistake. But my caseworker and I are waiting to hear back from the housing. I put an, I put an asterisk on it, on the stimulus check. And I wrote one time thing, but they took it as a whole year. So now it's like wanting me to pay it all year, you know? I was like, oh my goodness. That's why I didn't, I was scared to put the stimulus income on there, but I put it on there. I wanted to be straightforward with them, you know? This participant eventually was able to straighten out her rent with Section 8. However, she risked her housing in the process since she was unable to afford the inappropriately raised rent and feared that her landlord would evict her. The benefit of the stimulus check was quickly counteracted by the panic and expense of the ordeal. This type of situation repeated with other pandemic related changes to people's budgets as any minor change to a system that has both rigid rules and inefficient bureaucracy could create barriers to benefit receipt. While the stimulus checks were largely beneficial to SSI or SSDI beneficiaries, and the idea of universal cash transfers are a welcome alternative to the current welfare model, the ensuing problems underscore the degree of surveillance and rigidity beneficiaries live with. In part to cope with this surveillance and rigidity, some participants managed to make ends meet through informal survival strategies outside of the safety net system. These often included engaging in underground economies, bartering and trading with other SSI or SSDI recipients, and making use of personal connections to access free or low cost necessities. The disruptions to everyday life brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic altered everyone's context for living, which included the context of participants' informal creative workarounds. For example, one participant described the local practice of acquiring home goods and clothing through a semi-annual Berkeley event. Students moving in and out of dorms and leaving items they no longer wanted on the streets. It's called hippie Christmas or hobo Christmas, bums Christmas, and it happens, you know, twice a year. And well, the thing is, you know, students throw away some crazy stuff. So the really adventurous folks, they do all the dumpster diving and stuff like that and find, you know, phones and laptops and all this stuff that's thrown away in a frenzy to get out and get home and weed. I mean, crazy stuff. And so mostly I just get clothes and look for kitchen supplies. I have an awesome cast iron oven, you know, stuff like that. That's my thing. But the university stopped allowing students to place items outside this year. In an effort to prevent students from mingling outside of campus dorms during the hectic move out season and potentially spreading COVID-19, the university implemented new policies requiring students to register with a private service that would remove unwanted items from dorm rooms, thereby canceling Hobo's Christmas. This participant described having to add clothing back into her budget and the ripple effects that had on her finances. Many participants supplemented their benefit with part-time work, both under and over the table. For the two participants whose work became remote, 
they found access much improved and describe having wanted to work remotely for years with their requests to do so denied. However, the majority of participants who worked found their jobs eliminated due to pandemic restrictions and struggled to find new work in the newly tightened job market. One participant expressed significant distress over her newly unemployed status as she was a mother to three young children and unable to find work. It's been challenging because I can't find a job that will accommodate my disability and keep me safe. And without, you know, I mean, there's no availability of jobs right now for someone who's on social security disability because we are a compromise. Everything is limited, especially right now in the pandemic. There are so many people that need to work from home. So I didn't think that I even had a chance. And you know, that really affected me for my self-esteem and my confidence. In a devastating turn of phrase, this participant described how she perceived employers considering her as a disabled employee, as a, as a compromise. As a Black disabled woman receiving SSDI, this participant faced multiple types of workplace discrimination, and this was the first extended period of unemployment she struggled with since she was a teenager. She was devastated financially and struggling with the larger meaning she made out of her inability to find work. While disabled people have always faced employment discrimination, they were particularly impacted by employment conditions in the first year of the pandemic, as they perceived that the few jobs available would go to non-disabled workers before them. Okay, just almost finished. Um, participants, Pandemic experiences of finances, employment, care, and sense of self can largely be traced back to the influence of social security policy. The ripple effects of near or below poverty level benefits exacerbate the experience of inflationary prices and new costly routines required to survive the pandemic. Further, the inability of SSI recipients to maintain any personal safety net through the $2,000 asset limit leaves them even more vulnerable to any shifts in budget management. Both of these factors, low benefits and low assets, necessitate the use of multiple welfare programs to cover various life expenses. Additionally, welfare programs such as Section 8 do help make ends meet, and they also add rigid guidelines and complex bureaucracy to navigate. Lastly, the impact social security policy leaves on disabled people's relationship to the workforce is an indelible one that makes going outside of the social security system extremely challenging in any conditions and near impossible in emergency conditions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fantastic uh, talk, Katie. We are now going to transition to Q&A with uh, both Dr. Savin and soon to be Dr. Uh, Gary. Um, we've already got one question in the chat that looks really good. Kevin, did you want me to read that or do you wanna, you wanna verb, um, verbalize it? Yeah, uh, I can try to verbalize it. Um, an issue for both of these last two talks were the ways in which there are pressures to, to do certain things. So Mercer talked about the transfer of responsibilities from physicians or medical professionals to the proximal others in telehealth. I feel that very, very much uh, with our son's uh, move to online therapies of certain kinds. Um, and so that is sort of the outsourcing, right, of, of certain kinds of tasks to individuals. Katie's talk, I love this idea of the social security model of disability, um, but there's also a certain kind of incentive structure built into that. And, and the tricky part is there are good reasons for some people to, to want to go in the direction that make those structural pressures or incentives. Um, but how do we push back against the general, right, those... Uh, particular goods for particular people from becoming the default that then come to dominate our social interactions in these spheres that then right further disadvantage some of the people that are struck. I, I realize it's a really big question, but it's trying to balance the social pressures versus how the 
pressures are good for some of the folks, but not all of the folks subject to them. Thank you for that question. Um, well, I'm eager to hear what, what Marissa says, but what came to mind for me first um, is, um, is the impact of knowing that they exist and naming them, because I think a big issue, at least in the social security context, is the assigning of personal values or character to actions that are driven systemically. Um, so the idea that disabled people, for whatever reasons, well, for specific reasons often assigned as laziness, um, don't want to participate in the labor market is not understood or even are not able to because of disability is often not understood as a reaction to systemic um, policy. And I think there's often kind of a conflation of some of the conditions that result, such as extreme poverty, being on many welfare programs. And um, so I, I think being able to more correctly attribute causes to some of these issues is an important um, start to address them. I can just jump off of that by saying that I think uh, I, I agree with Katie, uh, and it is it bears out in the the case of uh, the distribution of caring responsibilities as well, where we know that when we uh, don't make visible and don't make uh, an object of uh, public democratic deliberation, how care responsibilities are distributed, that they will be uh, taken up primarily by the most precarious among us, um, predominantly in the United States, black and brown women, uh, who often immigrant women. And so part of the, uh, part of the conversation has to be uh, making it clear that even though it appears that this, this is a primarily virtual connection, that there is a material labor that is undergirding it, and that needs to be attended to. Uh, and and uh, so, so bringing forward the, the kind of work that is being done both by non-physician healthcare workers, but also community, uh, community caregivers and, and people themselves uh, in order to um, kind of go after the, the ways that that can be better supported, uh, directly addressed by, by Katie and some of these aspects of social security policy, like the, the $2,000 uh, asset uh, maximum. Uh, so turning from that, uh, that making visible of, uh, of work that is, has always been going on and continues to go on to uh, direct interventions. Other questions from the audience? Again, feel free to drop things in the chat if you'd prefer not to uh, speak. I have a question, but I've already gotten to ask a lot of questions and I feel bad going again. Oh, Eva. Gotten to ask a lot of questions. I feel bad asking your questions, uh, but uh, this is this is um, the the question of SSI and SSID uh, are are really um, questions that uh, need to be brought more to the public attention. Uh, so few people know about it. So few people understand it. Um, it ties in so. Um, completely with the question of precarity, the precarity of uh, liberal, neoliberal society, uh, from, with the precarity of the, the uh, home health aids, or, um, and uh, the, the contradictions between uh, these uh, social security uh, provisions and the provisions of the ADA, they are actually diametrically opposite. Uh, you know? So it, uh, the, the other thing that I think um, is brings, this brings to mind is, you know, people have been 
pushing me on autonomy here and um, something that I tend to resist. But uh, this is a good reason to resist them because uh, the, the, the push on autonomy is what makes uh, people with um, uh, disabilities who have to rely, who do rely on SSI and SSDI uh look like they're malingerers uh right um the and this is i think part of what kevin was bringing out um and um there we need a different conceptual framework you know one that that isn't as tied to notions of autonomy and um uh, even some of the wonderful things in ADA, uh, but that also understand the complexity, the complexity of living with disabilities, which uh, neither fit the autonomy model, nor can they, nor fit, uh, you know, total reliance on the state model or whatever. Uh, so uh, any comments you have to make on all of that? <laughs> Sure, thank you so much for sharing your comments. Um, I, I think what comes up from my participants most often um, as a way of responding is that um, there need to be more universal programs, um, mm -hmm. that it's not just, part of the, the problem is the, um, the contradictory messages around work. And, and part of it is the, way of measuring disability, which which then again goes back to measuring it as inability to work. Um, you know, there are other countries that don't tie disability payments to work. There are more and more places in the country and in the world that are looking at um, universal incomes. And, you know, so I think that that is one direction to hope for. Um, and I, I think there are also you know, while we do have this system, many, many ways to make it a little bit less painful, and that a lot of these policies are, are real remnants of, you know, amendments to the Social Security Act from decades ago, that there has just not been the political will to shift. And I agree with you that it does not get the attention that it merits for what a absurd um, and outdated system it is. Uh, you know, one, one, one small COVID point here is that the addition of many long-term, uh, you know, long-haul COVID patients uh, may really add to uh, the population of people who have at once been privileged, right, and who no longer can fall into that category and do have to uh, go the uh, disability route. And uh, perhaps there is an alliance there uh, to be made that can help to push public policy. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I don't know if they've completed it, but I know Social Security was working on kind of a definition for long COVID that would meet mm -hmm. its criteria. And it's definitely, mm -hmm. yeah, a silver lining I've hoped for as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I see uh, Sarah. There, Dr. So, Miller, excuse me. <laughs> Sarah works just fine. That's good. Um, so this is a question for Mercer. And I've had the, um, the good fortune to read the, the full chapter on which the work today was based. So I think, Mercer, the way you crystallized the work today really helped me figure out a question that I've had for a period of time, which I couldn't quite put my finger on. So I'm wondering if the redistribution of care that happens in telemedicine, um, I'm wondering whether it represents a difference in kind or a difference in intensity. Because, you know, for example, the concept of daily or hourly management um, of certain chronic conditions being left to people themselves in terms of self-care already happens extensively. And there is also already denial of support to precarious care workers. 
um, they already have a lack of resources. So what I'm trying to figure out is um, if telemedicine just makes a problem that already exists much worse, potentially, or whether it shifts the badness and transforms it into something else. Thanks so much for this question, Sarah. Yeah, that uh, that formulation of it is is really helpful for me as well. Um, I'm inclined to say that it's both. Uh, I think that there, you're certainly right that uh, that the daily hourly management um, of a number of different conditions is frequently left to to people themselves who are not receiving the uh, support they need to adequately uh, provide their own care or uh, or to others who 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 provide care for them, um, and and so telemedicine uh, is uh, is certainly increasing that uh, that dynamic I, I think exponentially, um, and as are the the conditions of the pandemic. But uh, I do think that there uh, there are new kinds of responsibilities, and there are or, or there are there are responsibilities that are, were not previously taken up by uh, by uh, individuals themselves and uh, uh, close proximate others who uh, who who are now confronting um, uh, both different aspects. Uh, aspects of, of, of medical care, I, I think here particularly of kind of assessing, uh, of involving others in assessment um, that, that is the, the kind of translation of a physical exam into telemedicine environment. Um, but uh, I think, uh, so, so uh, the, the idea there is that there are different, different activities that are being taken up by uh, by both people with chronic illness themselves and their close others uh, that were previously uh, dealt with more by uh, by healthcare workers, um, and uh, so so I I would say it's both in kind and in intensity. Okay, so it's both a redistribution and an amplification. Is right. that right? Awesome. Yes. Okay. Thanks. That helps. Thank you so much for uh, yet another fantastic panel. We are scheduled to take a short break. We are gonna come back right at, um, let's say 3.05. I want to make sure that people have enough time to grab a snack and go to the bathroom. We'll come back at 3.05. We have um, yet, if you've been paying attention, you'll see how amazing these panels have been. We have yet another uh, uh, fantastic panel coming up. This one will have four speakers. Ali Peabody Smith, Jonathan Flowers, April Dworitz, and Kevin Tempe. So you don't want to miss it. See you back here at 305.